So, it says really have 64 different noun cases. If I was Snopes, I would say that the answer is mixed. Yes, it does, but don't worry about it. Also, like, maybe it kinda doesn't? It really depends on what your definition of a noun case is, and where you draw the line between two things being separate cases. Says does have a specific suffix that you can use to show motion away from the inside of a hollow object that's far away, but it's not necessarily that complicated. Also, disclaimer, there's a descriptive grammar of says that I can't find anywhere. Apparently, it was funded in the 90s and then just never published. There is a short grammatical sketch that seems to be the source of the whole 64 cases thing and the source of most of the Wikipedia article, but I have my reservations about it. There's a few mistakes, inconsistencies, and parts of it that I don't necessarily agree with. I, personally, do not think that says is 64 noun cases. So how many does it really have? We'll get into all that, but first, what is a noun case? If you already know how to answer that question, skip to this time here. A noun case is something you add to a noun to show its grammatical role in a sentence or clause or noun phrase. A lot of things that English would express through prepositions or little helper words or word order would get expressed in other languages through noun cases, usually through a suffix, but not always. You can show whether a noun is the one doing the verb or the one the verb is being done to. You can show if a noun is possessing something, if you're doing something with that noun, or if the noun represents a location, in which case you can show whether the action is happening towards or away from that location, or go into even more detail. Cases are found in many languages throughout the world, but they do seem to be concentrated in specific areas, particularly Northern Eurasia, the Indian subcontinent, and Australia. Apart from the latter, the languages of these areas all seem to be overrepresented in the language learning community, so cases often seem to be near universal. It's really not. Also, whenever I see somebody ask the question, which language is the most difficult, or which language is the most complex, noun case seems to play a huge role in the answer. It seems like the number of cases a language has is directly proportional to its apparent difficulty to learn, but I think that comes from a very Eurocentric view on how noun case actually works. Indo-European languages are pretty robust when it comes to noun case, or at least they were, it's kind of dropped off of Western Europe and some other places. The thing about Indo-European cases is that they are very, very complex. Most Slavic languages, like Czech for example, have seven different cases, but they also have three different genders, and each gender has a different way of marking for case, often even multiple different ways. Add on to that a distinction between singular and plural, and that's a lot of different endings to memorise, except that a lot of them are the same, but not necessarily in any pattern. Plus, don't forget, adjectives, demonstratives, and sometimes even numerals have to agree with the nouns in case, but that doesn't mean they take the same endings that nouns do. Basically, memorize this chart, and this one, 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 and all these ones as well. This much drama for just seven cases, 64 cases, seems, well, it seems incomprehensible, doesn't it? Here's the thing, most languages in own case don't necessarily do it the way Indo-European languages do. Turkish has six different cases, but the forms they take are predictable. It looks like there's lots of different endings, but the different forms really just depend on which vowels a noun has and what sound the noun ends with. You can just look at a noun and usually tell exactly which form of any given case marker it'll take. There's no gender, and the plural marker is just stuck on before the case, not embedded within it like it is in Europe. Adjectives and demonstratives don't have to agree with a noun in number or case. Turkish only has one less case than Czech, but it seems infinitely easier. Suddenly, 14 cases in Basque, 15 in Finnish, and 18 in Hungarian seems kind of manageable. But 64 is still way too much, so we're going to have to look into that. Says is a Northeast Caucasian language, spoken by about 12,500 people, mainly in Dagestan. Says is part of the Tsezik branch of the Northeast Caucasian language family, so I looked into other Tsezik languages to get the bigger picture about Says cases when the grammar I was using fell short. This did help, but it didn't necessarily help too much. It is, it's times like this that I wish I could read Russian. Anyway, for the most part, Says is your typical Northeast Caucasian language, if you can imagine such a thing. There's a large inventory of consonants, featuring adjectives like p, t, k, k, lateral obstruents like th and th, and pharyngeals like ha and ra. There's a relatively small to average number of vowels, the standard five, a, e, u, a, o, and one long vowel, a. Syllables most often tend to be a consonant followed by a vowel, although sometimes clusters can come up. Says has four different genders, masculine, feminine, neuter, 
and another neuter. You should be happy to hear that the noun cases do not change in any way to agree with gender. The genders are expressed through demonstratives and through prefixes and verbs and some adjectives. These are actually some of the only prefixes in the language. Says is really heavy on the suffixes. Alright, let's just get into it. Says cases. First off, part one, the eight-ish syntactic cases. The syntactic cases are the ones that show a noun's grammatical role. The other 56 cases all show some sort of location. To start off with, we have syntactic case number one, the absolutive. This is the bare bones, naked, nothing to see here form of the noun. To put the noun into any other case, we have to use something called the oblique stem. It's a specific form of the noun that case markers get added onto, and I'm sorry to say that it's almost completely unpredictable. It's usually formed by adding a suffix, but there isn't really any way to know which suffix any given noun will take. Sometimes it involves changing the vowel of the stem instead, or even removing part of it. There is no real hard or fast rule as to how to put a noun into its oblique stem. It's one of those things that native speakers just already know. Luckily, the plural in says is quite simple. There's one suffix that gets added to absolutive nouns, and one suffix that gets added to oblique nouns. Now that we've got all this down, we can move on to syntactic case number two, the ergative. The ergative case is a very common feature of the languages of this specific area, and it's got a reputation. Basically, in a sentence that involves a noun acting on another noun, the one doing the acting is put into the ergative case. If a noun is just acting on its own, then it's left in the absolutive. Syntactic case number three, the genitive. A noun in the genitive case is usually possessing another noun. It kind of corresponds to the English word of in of this village, or the apostrophe s at the end of the bulls. It can also be used to show the material something is made of. This example, a silver bracelet, could also be said as a bracelet of silver. Syntactic case number four, the genitive part two, the remix. Okay, it says has two different genitives, one for possessing absolutive nouns and one for possessing oblique nouns. I would be really hesitant to call these two separate cases, seeing as they fill basically the exact same role. The grammars of the other Tzezic languages all count genitive 1 and genitive 2 as two separate cases. I'm not an expert in Northeast Caucasian languages, so my opinion on this doesn't hold much weight, but maybe Tzez only has 63 cases. Syntactic case number 5, the dative. This marks the indirect object, which is usually expressed in English for the word to. The boy gives the flower to the girl. The flower is the object being directly acted on, the girl is just to the side. In says, the dative is also used for the subject of a verb to do with perception, like seeing. Syntactic case number six, the instrumental. This is used to express with, using, or by means of a noun. It's the instrument you use to do something. The boy hit the snake with a stick. Syntactic case number seven, the equative. This is only kinda a noun case. It's used to say something is like or as something else. It does get added to the oblique form of the noun, but it can also be added to adverbs and numerals. I would say that this isn't really a noun case, it's more of just a modifier. Syntactic case number eight, the equative strikes back. What's the difference between the first and second equative? I have no idea, you tell me. The grammar I'm using just kinda lists it and then doesn't give any explanation or example of it. The other paper I was using in says syntax only has it once, and again, does not explain why it's used as opposed to the other one. I could speculate on why I think it gets used, but I don't even think equative 1 is a case, so equative 2 probably isn't going to do it for me either. So those are the 8 syntactic cases. In my opinion, there's only 5. But now, it's time for part 2, the 56 other cases. Does 56 not just seem like a very specific, easily divisible number? Because it is. It says forms its 56 other cases by combining things together in a very logical way. Basically, to mark a noun as location, we add a locative suffix. This suffix has three different slots, location, distance, and direction. Each slot is like a little mini suffix that gets glued onto the others to make one nice whole locative suffix. The first slot is used to show one of seven locations, which are as follows. Generally just at something, near something, inside a hollow object, like a bag or a building inside a mass noun like water or sand, on top of something, on the side of or on the face of something, and then under something. Some nouns, like house or evening or the names of places, already represent an inherent location, so they don't need to take anything in the location slot. The next slot is for distance. Usually this is left blank, which is known as zero marking, but there is the option of adding a distal marker, which shows that the location is further away, it's over there. The final slot shows the direction of the action. It can be left blank when there's no movement to just express being at a location. Then there is movement to a location. Notice that this is the exact same as the dative, which also kind of means to. 
It's up to you if you want to consider these different things. Next, there's motion from a location, and then there's motion towards a location. When we use the distal marker, towards takes a different form and changes meaning to beyond or behind. So that's it. That's basically how it says locked of cases work. Pick a location, then a distance, then a direction, then add them all together. To the top of something, add tor. Towards the face of something, add kahor. From the inside of a hollow object that's far away, add azai. Okay, it's not necessarily too easy. Sometimes when things are added together, they end up sounding a little bit different. Whenever two vowels come next to each other, like in this last example, one of them overlaps the other. You would expect towards the bottom of something to be tlahor, but it's actually tlhor, and after certain locations, Ahor can optionally just be shortened to ar. The thing is though, now that it's spread out like this, it doesn't really seem like 56 totally separate locked of cases. They are a tiny bit fusional, it's not exactly just sticking things together, but like, it pretty much is. These also all take Latin names, but I'm not sure if they're actually helpful. If distal contemplative means anything to you, then congrats. Using Latin names also means that the underneath case is called the possessive, and I don't know how to feel about that. Also, says isn't Latin. But yeah, 7 by 4 times 2 add 8 is indeed 64, but like... Eight syntactic cases, plus 7 different locations, plus 2 distances and 4 directions, is only really like 26 different things. Plus, we don't really need to distinguish two genitives. I don't really think the two equatives count as cases, or the two distal markers so much as their modifiers onto other cases. There's four different directions, but like, one of them's zero marked, and the other one is the exact same as the dative. 5 plus 7 plus 2 is only 14 different suffixes, but they can still be stacked on top of each other, which is called suffix alfnama, or just case stacking. Sometimes, after stacking suffixes together, the thing we're left with looks quite different from what it's made of, but that's based on completely predictable sound rules. You could, in theory, say that says has 56 different locative cases, but if you add that to 5 syntactic cases, you get 61, which is as high as I'm willing to go. Anyway, in conclusion, linguistic terminology isn't always one size fits all, but it often tries to be, for better or for worse. Maybe when we apply our definition of noun case that says, we get a really ridiculous answer because our definition of noun case doesn't really fit says. There is quite a bit of Eurocentrism in linguistics, if you didn't know. A lot of the time when we try to document and describe different languages from all over the globe, the words we use kind of fall short to express certain concepts. Probably because these concepts didn't exist in Latin or Greek or Sanskrit, which is where we get most of our linguistic jargon from. We often just end up inventing brand new Latin words to describe languages that have nothing to do with Latin. This isn't me cancelling linguistics, at least not yet anyway. All I'm saying is, things often seem really bizarre, but it's only because of our perspective, which is biased towards what we already know. When you ask somebody what's the most difficult language, they just answer the question, which language is the least like English, which is kind of like saying, which country is the furthest away. It doesn't really matter where you go, the answer is always going to be China. It's always China. Anyway, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Mythbusters. This is my second video. My first video is going to be linked somewhere. My third video is on its way. As an outro, I'd just like to point out that says has evidentiality, with a witnessed and unwitnessed past tense. Basically, when you're talking about something that happened, we need to know if you saw it happen, or if you just heard it from somebody else. Okay, bye.